last video, we took a look at the onset of nuclear weapons at the start of the Cold War to the end of the Cold War. But of course, the end of the Cold War doesn't bring an end to having nuclear weapons. They are still in existence. So we're going to continue to look at the issue of nuclear weapons here in part two. Let's start with arguments favoring and arguments against having nuclear weapons. So in favor of one of the main ones that we could definitely take away from the first video was deterrence. As a reminder, deterrence was that idea or is that idea that if you have nuclear weapons, then it will deter or persuade other countries from attacking that nation with nuclear weapons. So that's one of the ideas behind favoring it. And in turn, if countries are unwilling to attack other countries, then this will make the world a safer place. The last thing mentioned there is a shift away from these all-powerful nuclear weapons that will destroy the earth um, many times over to a smaller, more tactical nuclear weapon for usage. As for arguments against having nuclear weapons, uh, there are quite a few, some of which are not even named here, such as um, effect on the environment and nuclear fallout, but there are a number of other things mentioned here, such as accidents, unauthorized use, false alarms. False alarms are a category where that happened on numerous occasions during the Cold War. Uh, it didn't happen, of course, but the, those examples exist. Danger of state collapse. What happens if a nation that is a weapon, a nuclear weapons holding nation, what happens if it collapses and falls into the wrong hands in essence? Let's go back to accidents as an argument against having nuclear weapons. When I think of an accident, I think of the accident that happens and all the consequences that come with it. But what if there's an accident and the consequences don't come with it? Is it still an accident? Well, Goldsboro, North Carolina, 1961, something similar happened. A B-52 bomber is flying over North Carolina and sure enough, something goes wrong and two nuclear weapons, I believe hydrogen bombs, plummet to the earth and don't explode. Is it an accident? Absolutely. But you might be hearing about it for the first time because we don't have the consequences that come with the nuclear explosion. Russia today, 2020, has the most nuclear weapons in the world, but it's not until the 1970s that Russia will surpass how many nuclear weapons the United States has. And those two countries have the most by far. At the end of the video, we will take a look at a map that shows how many countries have nuclear weapons and how many each has approximately as of 2017. One thing that a number of nuclear weapons holding nations have participated in as of this day are cooperative threat reduction programs, or simply countries have been willing to get rid of some nuclear weapons that they have. However, that has slowed in recent years. So it's important to keep that in mind that even though countries are participating in this, this has slowed down. The last item on here is the 1972 Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. And one of the important takeaways here is post-Cuban Missile Crisis that we took a look at in the last video, we see countries start to put some restrictions and limitations on themselves, okay, specifically the United States and the Soviet Union. And we see this happen a number of times through non-proliferation treaties in SALT 1, SALT 2, but here's an example of the United States as part of a treaty, and then sure enough, when it is in their best interest, they withdraw from a treaty. Ultimately, a lot of steps have been taken to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons. All the steps that really have been taken 
have happened post Cuban Missile Crisis. That's true of everything on here. At the same time, as the Cold War drew to a close, it no longer became a nuclear weapons show or showdown between the United States and the Soviet Union. When the Cold War ended, really many more states became involved and it became a global and international effort to stop the spread of nuclear weapons and the different materials that make nuclear weapons. Resolution 1540 is an example of that. It is a particular uh, resolution and action taken by the UN to stop the spread of nuclear weapons because they don't want those nuclear weapons to fall into the hands of non-state actors or groups like terrorists. The next part of the reading goes into four proliferation cases. I won't go into the detail that the reading does, but give you a takeaway or two regarding each case. For India and Pakistan, it's important to note that India was a its own country, like it is today, but when the British left around that 1946 period, there was a lot of infighting. Like so many colonized countries, when the colonizer, the British, leave, who's going to take control? Who's going to have power when the country gains its independence? And that was a problem India was faced with. Eventually, Pakistan broke off and became its own country. But the infighting that occurred in India prior to Pakistan's existence was problematic. And once India had a nuclear weapon, as for North Korea, North Korea is the country that grabs all the headlines today as far as another country looking to have nuclear weapons. And it has not been ashamed at expressing how badly they want to use, uh, have them and their willingness to use them. Before North Korea had all the headlines for being a country with nuclear ambition, it was actually Iran that made a lot of headlines during the George W. Bush and President Obama administrations. The United States believed that Iran had a well-developed nuclear program. Anything that had to do with a nuclear program from Iran's perspective was argued to be a for nuclear power, not anything to do with nuclear weapons. So it's important to note that in order to have nuclear power, which can be better for the environment compared to other ways to create power, well, you also have the possibility of making nuclear weapons. Another takeaway from Iran was that Iran would not submit to you to the UN coming in and doing a nuclear check to make sure that Iran was indeed telling the truth. Libya, on the other hand, well, they received some information from Pakistan, from North Korea, and the United States did not view them as a country that should have access to nuclear materials. Well, here's an example of a country that did allow the UN to come into its country and make sure that it was legit in the sense that it did not have any nuclear program. Here's a map showing the number of nuclear weapons in the world today. The USA and Russia, they certainly stand out because of the amount, but there are two here that I think are worth pointing out and mentioning. The first is North Korea, which we're going to take a look at in the next video, as mentioned. But the other one is Israel. And that's important to note because of Israel's strong relationship with the United States. Despite the UN becoming more and more involved over the past few decades regarding nuclear weapons and nuclear materials and the limitations and restrictions of them, 
the UN is still struggling with a major component regarding their policies. What they're struggling with is enforcement. When a country breaks away from a treaty or a resolution and blatantly goes against it, how does the UN enforce it? Ultimately, it struggles to do so, and we see that with North Korea, which we'll talk about in the next video. Until then, hope to see you soon. Bye.